Frank Zappa's Alien Orifice is a brilliant piece of music that truly highlights what makes him unique as a composer, arranger, and guitarist. Even for Zappa's standards, there are key elements that make it special. In addition to these, we get his trademark techniques like lots of Lydian, fast odd time runs, and of course, reggae. There are three great versions appearing on Frank Zappa Meets the Mothers of Prevention, Make a Jazz Noise Here, and You Can't Do That on Stage Anymore, Volume 6. Before any of these were even recorded, however, the first four chords would pop up with the 1980 band, used as a solo section for The Torture Never Stops. This can be heard on the Buffalo album, where keyboardist Tommy Mars solos over the progression around 10 minutes and 48 seconds. Let's start by taking a look at those chords now. The tune begins with 16 bars of four chords, E flat major 7 sharp 11, E minor 11, C major 7 sharp 11, and G minor 9. Those numbers added to the chords are extensions, or chord notes that are built by specifically going above the 7th degree. The melody heavily emphasizes these notes, as we'll see later on. The two modes related to these chords are Lydian and Dorian, which are Zappa's most preferred modes in his diatonic music and improvisation. The Lydian usage on the major 7th chords is obvious because the melody emphasizes the defining note of the scale, the sharp 11. The melody emphasizes the natural 11th and 9th, not the natural 6th on the minor chords. However, it's safe to assume both imply a Dorian usage, because there's honestly not a whole lot of Aeolian in his music, and he clearly uses Dorian on both during his solos as well. As you can see, these chords are not operating as traditional or functional harmony, because there isn't a clear dominant resolution, which does have its use in Zappa's music. Sometimes we get a 1, 6, 4, 5. Commonly used in doo-wop, or a 2, 5, 1. Commonly used in jazz. Besides those obvious cases of functional harmony, what we're met with music like this in Frank's work I think is really important to meet it on its own terms. To me that means using terms like borrowed chords, analyzing with Roman numerals, or even calling them chord progressions doesn't give you the full picture. So these chords are an example of something in Frank's music that we might call modal center switching. This is a form of modulation in Frank's diatonic music where we get a switch of the root mode on every chord change. Think of it like you can go anywhere from C Lydian to F sharp Dorian to E flat Lydian or B Lydian to anywhere you want. And there are plenty of Frank's compositions that use it, like the Black Page, Inca Rhodes, or Montana. In Alien Orifice, we get a switch from E flat Lydian to E Dorian, then C Lydian, and then finally G Dorian. So we get these neat little movements that imply completely different sounds for each chord in different keys. Looking at the first two chords, we get what I think is the most common type of center switch in Frank's music. This is the minor 7, major 7 half step movement. Now, there are four types of these, and they're all heavily used in Frank's music. The first type is a minor 7 to a major 7 a half step up. This would be used in songs like Black Napkins. Or Jumbo Go Away. The second type is a minor 7 to a major 7 a half step down. This would be used in songs such as 20 Small Cigars, or at the end of Drowning Witch. Or, as we'll talk about later, an alien orifice. The third type is a major 7 to a minor 7 a half step up, and like I said, is the first two chords of Alien Orifice. It's also used as the main thematic idea of leather, 
which features a cycle of the switching used chromatically. It's also the basis of the synth solo, which uses this cycle. And the fourth and final type, major 7 to a minor 7 a half step down. This is tunes like Peaches and Regalia. Or even in the same exact key, Father Oblivion. And it's also used in solo sections such as Inca Roads, Any Kind of Pain, and Don't You Ever Watch That Thing. So the first two chords of Alien Orifice are in fact a really important part of his harmonic framework. And the nice thing about these chords with 11th specifically is that we can sort of establish them as a formation of two triads, either a major or minor third apart. This usually presents some interesting movement with the top triads. Like here we get a parallel D minor to D major chord. A lot of times the way he deals with center switching in these chords in particular is with commonality. Just by examining a Dorian and Lydian scale separated by half step, we can find five notes or a pentatonic scale in common. Even in the melody of Black Napkins, the very first five notes he plays make up the C-sharp minor pentatonic scale, and as we'll see later, the melody of Alien Orifice literally plays on common tones. Common tones and pedal points are important traits to highlight in general, with pedal points getting its name from when an organist would use the foot pedal to sustain the note while the harmonies change on top of it. Sort of like the classical section in Easy Meat. Or, in the Deathless Horsey, which we could refer to as an inverse pedal, because the top voice carries the same single line while the bass notes change underneath. Before I get too far from talking about the tune, I wanted to highlight this because I think we can tie it into a huge theme in Zappa's music, and Alien Orifice as a whole. The reuse of material is all over Frank's work. Oftentimes we'll see a theme completely restated between different songs. Together with 10% fruit juice for the taste everybody loves. But in musical terms, I want to show that Frank presenting themes in different contexts can happen small or large scale. We already know common tones and pedal points. There's also pedal substitution or a melodic statement repeats with a different harmonic pedal, or a synchrony, which he describes as a resynchronization of different tracks in order to create a merged performance, like in Joe's Garage, with live guitar solos dubbed over studio band, also combining pedal substitution. There's also isorhythm, which as we can see in the black page number one, is changing notes that adhere to a single rhythmic pattern. Notice how these phrases are the exact same rhythmically, but completely different melodically. The opposite of this would be isomelism, and Inca Rhodes is an absolute masterclass in this. We can describe this as unrestricted rhythm adhering to a repeated melodic pattern. There's also tons of pedal substitution here, another combination of techniques. There's really almost too many examples of these techniques in here to go through now. And finally, there's style change, which former Zappa drummer Chad Wackerman can explain. You would learn a tune in a certain style, and, um, and then if he did this, that would mean make it reggae the next, starting the next <laughs> quarter note. Or he'd oh. sometimes give you two beats, a little cue, then it'd be rattly dat with like three and four. <laughs> Whatever the tune was before, now it's reggae. <laughs> <laughs> then he had this is ska, and then um, this one was weather report. <laughs> of course, this can happen other than in an improvisational setting like how the black page number two was presented as disco, reggae, polka, and even new age throughout the years. Or just think of the third movement of Sinister Footwear, which started out as a guitar solo. Eventually arranged for symphony orchestra. And of course, this all ties into conceptual continuity, the fact that there are themes throughout that are connected. You don't just have to take my word for it, though. If Frank can arrange something like Poodles as a waving thread into so many different contexts, 
Why can't he take melodic statements and arrange them in different contexts and have it all relate to each other? The point is, we can clearly see that having something consistent portrayed in different permutations is working on all levels throughout Frank's music. I think in a roundabout way, this all relates to Frank's idea of time, but that's a subject matter I'm way underqualified to speak about. All of these are going to appear again throughout the tune, especially the melody which plays on common tones, so let's look at those. When we lay out the four modes, we can see that there are exactly three common tones between them. G, A, and D. Ironically enough, this spells out a G sus2 chord, something Zappa uses to great extent, and we'll talk about that later. Another thing to make note of is the symmetrical root movement of the minor to the major chords. The E, Dorian, the C, Lydian center switch is very close in how they're built, with only a one note difference between the two, with the major 6 in the Dorian scale being C sharp, and the root of the Lydian scale being C. Zappa really loves the relationship between E minor and C. In particular, it shows up around the 1980 through 82 periods of tunes, like Let's Move to Cleveland. or what's new in Baltimore, or pick me I'm clean. So the same similarities between E Dorian and C Lydian obviously applies to G Dorian to E flat Lydian which starts the cycle all over again. Like I said before, these common tones are played upon heavily in the melody, so let's hear that now. There's a great interview in Guitar Magazine 1979 where the interviewer comments on how Frank develops lines and themes. He mentions Stravinsky and Verez and how they would use very basic material and turn that into the motif and keep modifying it. He specifically mentions integrals for how he gets a lot of mileage out of those two notes. The piece, written in 1925 and scored for wind, brass, and percussion, has an opening motif that predominantly centers around the pitch B-flat. It recurs consistently, altered with rhythmic variation. Frank even got a chance to conduct the performance in 1983. Do you see where I'm going with this? The parallels are obvious, because in Alien Orifice, the motif is built around this big fat common tone of A on every chord, with the exception of the C major 7 sharp 11. And hey, look at that. Two three note motifs there. What makes the melody in both cases is what happens around the emphasized notes. Here we see the slight change between the G and the A, Either a B-flat for E-flat Lydian or G-Dorian, or B for E-minor Dorian or C-Lydian. These are an example of approach notes, literally any notes leading into the target note, which is A in this case. More specifically, they're enclosures, which is sort of a jazz terminology. We can boil it down to two preceding notes above and below a target note used chromatically or diatonically. In the case of this melody, Zappi uses them diatonically, where he takes the G and skips a scale step to B-flat or B, landing back on A. You can mix up chromatic and diatonic enclosures, and it's a very effective tool to really emphasize a target note. What keeps it subtle is that it retains the contour and exact rhythm, which keeps the unity and coherence while adding variety with the subtle change in enclosure. If it was changed too much, we would lose that motif completely. And if you were told that the melody centered around a single note, you'd probably be right to expect some monotony. What breaks this up is a different rhythmic unit for each A, with the exception of the repeated whole note. It gets smaller every time in the first two bars, and the beat placement is also moved around. At the end of the phrase, we get this tuplet, 12 notes in the space of 8. We get flashes of the motif except both times landing elsewhere other than the A, which it really dances around. I think it reminds me of this part of Little House I Used to Live In, just because it has a similar enclosure, but he had a really beautiful way of phrasing repeated notes. The beaming here is 3, 4, 2, 3 instead of all 3s, but this is for phrasing purposes. Later, we'll actually see more examples of beaming you would not expect. One of the things I love about this is that even though these are all chord tones, the A gets repeated so much that the G and B flat almost start to sound like tension. 
It's rare to see the sharp 11 in this case, being used as the target note, instead of using it in the enclosure or as a passing tone, to fit moving in some fashion from 3rd to 5th. He creatively toys with tension and resolution. I'll let Frank expound. A melody functions against a harmonic climate in terms of what is the fractional delay between the time that you hit a note that is tension to that chord to the time that you hit a note which is inside the chord which creates a resolution. That's how melodies work. Although all of the notes of the enclosure are in the chord, the repeated melodic emphasis makes our ears treat the third and fifth as the closest thing to tension and the A as resolution. And there are different ways of this device showing up, especially rhythmically, like over the C major 7 sharp 11, which starts out with the same exact rhythmic idea that begins the other phrases, except with the sharp 11 of C, F sharp instead of A. Then instead of continuing the pattern, we're hit with two 16th note septuplets, which means we have to play seven notes evenly spaced. This is great tension, because it's rhythmically dissonant with the beat, which means it does not line up exactly. In this first septuplet, we also get two eighths instead of four sixteenths, which makes a difficult rhythm even more challenging. We get the full effect of the normal beat and the foreign tuplet juxtaposed on top of that into the next bar's rhythmic resolution. There's even a fake out with the motif returning around the A, making you think it's going to stay on the note targeted on the last two chords before falling back down to the new note, F sharp. As a side note, the first septuplet with the two eighths instead of four sixteenths is a rhythmic device that I think Frank is very fond of. In addition to Alien Orifice, I've also noticed it in tunes like Ink Roads, twice in the Bebop Tango, of course in the Black Page. and in the outhead of Big Swifty. Interestingly, the phrase was originally twice as fast, happening the span of half a measure. There's a great demo on YouTube of Steve Vai, probably from early 1981, playing these septuplets in the space of two beats instead of four. There's a certain motif in this phrase that occurs four times, of two notes descending, then ascending back to the original note. The first three times are all stepwise diatonically, the third one with that nice repeated note in there that breaks up the pattern before returning up. The fourth time this motif appears, it utilizes the highest point of the entire collection and sort of the climax of the phrase with the largest jump of seven steps from the note before. And instead of going down stepwise and returning, it goes down four steps, the largest distance of the pattern, or a major third, and returns. This of course includes the diatonic enclosure motif of A, before falling down to the note that starts the phrase, working as a perfect bookend. We can see that this phrase uses almost the entire C Lydian scale, minus the root. But the way it's shaped is so nice, it's not just running up or down the scale, despite using almost all of it. Its rising and falling motions actually reminded me of another Zappa melody. And even looking at the ordered pitch intervals, which measures the distance with a plus or minus sign, we can see the three three note patterns that are exactly the same. We see the plus one, plus two, minus two, which opens both phrases, minus two, minus one, plus one, and the climax for both. Minus 2, plus 2, plus 7. I love that these phrases share a very similar contour, and basically the same exact intervallic content. By the way, has anyone else noticed that the second movement of Sinister Footwear quotes the Alien Orifice motif? So we get to the first ending of the theme, and we encounter the 12 tuplet again, except this time it's a bit different melodically, starting off with the same two notes as the other times, but then with the diatonic enclosure of the root, then an arpeggiation of a C sus 2, and then a walk up diatonically of G Dorian. But where it gets interesting is when we get another tuplet inside this already formed 12 notes in the space of 8. Where we would normally have 6 16th notes, we get a septuplet. There's a great article that Steve Vai wrote on his website called Tempo Mental that does a great job explaining this device called a nested tuplet. The gist is really that you can take any of the beats of a tuplet, subdivide, and add in another tuplet, as the same principle applies to them as it does normal beats. The black page number one is a fantastic example. We start off with a quarter note triplet on beat three. 
In the space of the first beat of the triplet, we can throw in five evenly spaced notes. On the second beat of the triplet, we can throw in another quintuplet. And on the last beat of the triplet, we can throw in a sextuplet, or six even notes. So now we have the full phrase and a good understanding of nested tuplets. You can push these concepts very far, as was usual for Zappa. So I get that the 12 tuplet is essentially the same rhythmic value as four groups of triplets, ultimately defeating the purpose of me going through all of that, but at least we understand this concept. And there are times when there's a conscious decision to notate it differently into one unit instead of broken up, like the case here, for phrasing, grouping, or accenting purposes. Before we talk about the repeat of the first theme, I want to discuss the stylistic treatment of how this main theme is presented, sort of the feel or rhythmic climate it's in. Right away, there's a couple things going on that establish this. The bass is walking or playing quarter notes of chord tones that outline the progression linearly, and the drums are playing time on the ride cymbal while accenting the melody. Enough evidence at this point to call it jazz, 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 jazz. 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 It's going to be important to keep track of how the same harmonic content is presented stylistically. Just as I highlighted earlier, we're going to see some brilliant deviations. Now after the first repeat, we're back to the main theme. There are two differences this time. Bass ostinato and harmony. An ostinato is a repeated musical figure. A lot of times we can call them riffs. So instead of the walking bass on the first statement of the melody, we now have a written bass line. And he loves written hummable bass lines. The line has a real nice shape. Another instance of using almost the entire scale except the 13s on both, but not in an up and down fashion. It's actually just a straight up arpeggiation of both 11 chords, but moved around a bit. It starts on the root and moves up to the 9th, down to the 7th, down to the 3rd, then down to the root before going back up to the highest point on the 11th, back down to the 9th, down to the 5th, and then ending on the root again. Those 16th note hits on the root line up accordingly with the melody, but it also functions as something pretty interesting. The phrase begins again but starting on beat 4, making it a 7 beat phrase and having it not line up against the beat the same way. The 9th ends up on beat 1, the 7th on beat 2, the 3rd on beat 3, so on and so forth. What fixes it into being symmetrical again on the next chord is one more note on the and of beat 1 to make it a 9 beat phrase and line up and start all over again. So when the harmony comes in, it's two parts both played on the electro comp by Tommy Mars. The higher part is panned right and the lower part panned left, forming a complete triad. And the first harmonization on E flat major 7 sharp 11 has an F and a C underneath the melody note of A, spelling out an F triad. Completely logical, as the major 2 chord over the 1 is the most obvious Lydian sound. The 12 tuplet in the second half of the phrase moves in all triads as well. F, E flat, and G minor. The same exact guidelines apply to the E minor and C major, as we get an F sharp minor triad harmonized underneath the A melody note on E minor, and a D major triad underneath the F sharp melody note on C major. G minor is where we start to break things up a little, starting off with the same exact triad over the E flat, F major. Now this time, we get a little bit of movement in the lowest voice chromatically, from C to C sharp and ending on D. This is a passing tone, a non-chord tone used to pass from one chord tone to another. We start off on the F triad and move the C up to a D, spelling out DFA, or a D minor triad. This always struck me as a Tommy Mars sort of movement more than Frank that he might have done as an overdub in the studio. That's just some wild speculation on my part though. We hit the second ending and it's a familiar rhythmic figure but completely different melodically. The first 12 tuplet to start on a note other than A. We also see a B flat major arpeggio, two note patterns, and a walk down diatonically from that B flat. This leads us perfectly into the next new section, the first solo. The very first solo section of the tune has a set of changes with only one chord quality, minor 11th. These parallel chords have a set motion, going up a half step, up a fifth, down a whole step, and then down a minor third, where the cycle starts all over again. Frank really likes using these sequences or cycles with parallel movement. In fact, this isn't even the first time we see a keyboard solo with the same sort of movement. Redunzel, as it was played by the 73 band, features a fast 3-4 solo for George Duke, 
that has different chord qualities, but still goes up a fifth, down a whole step, up a fourth, then up a major third, where the cycle starts again. And if that wasn't enough evidence, the Hot Rats tune It Must Be a Camel also features root movement of up a fifth and down a whole step, with the difference being that it falls down a half step at the end. But it even has the same exact root movement as Redunzel, and it goes up a whole step for the next cycle. Ultimately, he decides on keeping the chord qualities all the same with minor 11s and alien orifice. And what's interesting is that there's actually some discrepancy between recordings on where the first chord starts. First, on Frank Zappa Meets the Mothers of Prevention, we get a synth solo by Tommy Mars that starts on E minor 11. Next recording is You Can't Do That on Stage Anymore, Volume 6, another synth solo by Tommy Mars starting on E minor 11. The last recording is Make a Jazz Noise Here, and we get a tenor solo by Albert Wang, except this time, changes start on B flat minor 11. Originally, the score has B flat minor 11 as the chord after the second ending. Not exactly sure why there is a change or what prompted it in the first place, but it's possible after he changed it, Frank might have deferred back to the score again for the next band and forgot he changed it at all, which might explain the disparity. There's also tape of the 84 band playing it despite no official release, and they start the solo section on B flat as well, meaning the change happened that year. But either way, these chords work with the melody coming in and out of the section either landing as a major 6 on the E minor, strong Dorian sound again, or a minor 3rd on the B flat. And the minor 3rd cycle works perfectly with either starting point, going up from the E minor, or down from the B flat, to land on the first chord of the new section, G minor 11. I also want to note that having two solos with completely different vamps is a really neat and unique compositional device. I'm sure there are even more examples than these, but it reinforces how abundant his ideas were, that it doesn't have to be the same changes for every soloist. So this solo section leads into a little 4-bar interlude, and it's a pattern-based melodic phrase. We get a dotted half note that goes down a minor second, and up a minor third into the next bar, where the pattern repeats. Down a minor second, up a minor third again. This ends up with an interesting row of whole steps. The notes on beat 1 ending up as C, D, E, F sharp while the notes on beat 4 end up as B, C-sharp, D-sharp. And it's actually retaining some previous qualities that we've seen. The contour has the same down-up motion as the septuplet of the first ending. The difference being, the septuplet is purely diatonic in G minor, where it goes down a step and up a third, whereas this interlude is down chromatically, then up a minor third every time regardless of the harmony. Speaking of which, we get some new chord qualities here. Let's hear this beautiful interlude again now with that harmony. At first glance, it seems pretty strange as to how it might operate, but if we look closer, we can see another characteristic we've seen before. It keeps the beginning of the previous root movement for part of it, but with completely different chord qualities this time. We see it go up a half step and up a fifth, but with a dominant 7 sharp 9 and a major 7 sharp 9 instead of parallel minor 11s. That's sort of a deviation on the minor 7, major 7 half step movement, but instead of a major 7, we get a dominant 7 sharp 9 built as 1, 3, 5, flat 7, and sharp 9, or a major 7, sharp 9, built as 1, 3, 5, 7, sharp 9. The dominant 7, sharp 9 is usually associated with Jimi Hendrix and Purple Haze, but usually functions as a dominant in diatonic music because of how the altered chord resolves to a tonic. The major 7, sharp 9 is usually indicative of a polychord of two triads and major 7th apart, like B major over C major, in which case C major 7 sharp 9 sharp 11 would also suffice. This harmony shows up a lot in modern jazz. Like a lot of harmonic material with Frank, it isn't used for its regular purpose though, and instead goes up a fifth, mimicking the root movement of the previous section. I've noticed literally the same exact melodic phrase elsewhere in Frank's work, in a, uh, let's just say a nice moderate waltz. Completely different rhythmically and harmonically though, very interesting to see this phrase again. So we encounter some other new harmony here in this interlude, this minor chord with a sharp 11. Normally you'd think of half diminished if you saw a sharp 11 or flat 5 over the minor chord, but this is a little bit different. I'll let Tommy Mars explain. Frank and I both, before I joined the band, this has always been a very strong impetus to me harmonically, is the minor Lydian. You have a C minor on the bottom, and you have a D major on the top. It's something way deep inside me. It was way deep inside Frank, too. It's all over his music. So this minor Lydian, as he calls it, 
could be thought of as a minor triad plus a major triad a major second away. The same way we can build Lydian with two major triads, we change the first one to minor to get this distinct sound. This usually corresponds with Dorian sharp 4, the fourth mode of harmonic minor. And he's totally right, it's all over, particularly in compositions written around the 79 to 82 period of Frank's works. It's the almost cartoonishly evil sound, like in Sinister Footwear, Drowning Witch, or the end of Mogio on You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 5. It's used very briefly here, but we'll come back to this haunting sound later in the tune. Right after this interlude, we finally hit the guitar solo. So the first thing to mention is that we get a new ostinato introduced, which is a very common trait for Frank the solo over. The interesting thing is that these riffs are all over some changes, as opposed to one static chord. And look at that, we even recognize these chords. We have the same exact changes we see over the melody here. Frank even quotes it sometimes to start his solo. So this is our first deviation for the main theme, where the constant is the chords that open the tune. This time the style is changed to straight eighth rock and roll, complete with riffs played by the rhythm section, including some pretty gnarly distorted guitar by Steve Vai. So now, Frank cleverly takes the same harmonic material and disguises it a little bit with the change from jazz to rock. And what's interesting is that this is actually a rather uncommon solo section for him. It's not normal to see this many changing harmonies combined with this fast, a harmonic rhythm. Frank even says himself that he doesn't like chord changes, and would prefer one or two with the option to imply different harmonies. So why are we seeing something like this in one of his solo sections? Well, what allows us to be comfortable is that Lydian and Dorian are already such a huge importance in his improvisational style. Not to mention, these four tonalities, with maybe the exception of the E-flat, are pretty consistent for previous solo sections. We can make some stretches to match these to other tunes. For example, Pound for a Brown off Zappa in New York has an F mix Lydian tonality, but you could also say he was playing over E-flat Lydian or C Dorian shapes, as they're all related. After that, it was hard for me to come up with more solos in this tonality. Maybe you could make a case for Cosmic Debris, but that probably lies in a more pentatonic blues realm than modally E-flat Lydian or C Dorian. The other chords have more examples though. E Dorian has big swifty in the 70s, or it could also include A mix Lydian, which would be solos like Suit Allures starting in the 80s, or Hot Plate Heaven at the Green Hotel, a widely explored tonality there. C Lydian is probably an obvious one to you guitar players out there who've ever jammed over Inca Roads. Not sure it would need many more examples given how extensively Frank delved into that, but it could also be Pick Me I'm Clean or A Holiday in Berlin. Or if we include Relative A Dorian, The Torture Never Stops or Lay the Pimp could also fit. And lastly, G Dorian, which definitely fits for City of Tiny Lights. Either the original Sheik Your Booty or Carlos Santana version works here. Definitely Advanced Romance if you want to include the blues or pentatonic ones, but if we put in B-flat Lydian, we also get Outside Now or the Black Page Number 2 starting in the 80s. And if we throw in C-mix Lydian, you could also argue Stinkfoot, literally the reverse chord progression of Outside Now. So clearly Zappa comes in with some comfort despite four chord changes. Now these riffs are interesting in that they're always a pickup into the new harmony, starting on B2 of the bar. And at least for the guitars, they always include a held note on the downbeat. The first one on E-flat Major 7 is the only one that doesn't hold on the root, with the major 6, C instead. Fi's guitar, which is pan left on Frank Zappa meets the Mothers of Prevention, is really dripping in feedback on that C. The pattern here begins on the root and then descends. 1, 7, 6, 5. The next riff for E minor sees the pattern go down a half step on D, C sharp, B, A now, instead of E flat, D, C, B flat. This now makes the pattern start on the flat 7 and descend 6, 5, 4, before holding on that low E on the guitars. That major 6 of C sharp is that Dorian sound once again. The next riff on C major 7 breaks the pattern now, just like the melody breaks the pattern on the very same chord here. Very clever. It seems like it could be staying on the E minor with the first notes, G, F sharp, A, F sharp, then hitting E on the downbeat, before making it a delayed resolution and falling on the root on beat 3. Like I said, this mimics the delayed resolution we saw in the melody before where it hits the A, making you think it's going to stick there before falling down to F sharp. Now if we put this in the context of C major 7, it becomes 5, sharp 4, 6, sharp 4, 3, 1. That sharp 4 of course being the giveaway for the Lydian sound. Finally, the G minor, which like the chord itself, sees a minor third transposition from E minor. With the same exact riff, that also means we see a descent from flat 7, 6, 5, 4, with the major 6 bringing the Dorian sound once again. One upside I think putting ostinatos into the solos has, there's some built-in space to allow Frank and the drummer to really go for it without being too tied down. 
Frank was certainly conscious to rhythm sections overplaying during their accompaniment, as evidenced by the inspiration for the name Watermelon and Easter Hay. So, by giving people a part and making them stick to it, the risk that they'll overplay decreases dramatically. If that happens, Frank probably felt a lot more free to explore the amount of space he had. I found particularly in the 80s, he started adding new vamps to old songs that gave him a huge amount of space, like the 84 version of Advanced Romance, or the 84 version of Illinois Anima Bandit, or the 81-82 version of The Black Page. Now as for Frank's actual solos here, I figured it'd be more helpful and interesting if I nailed down the real characteristics he employs and look at specific phrases rather than go through each entire solo. I'd hate to essentially boil down someone who I think is one of the best guitar players and improvisers to ever live, but there are three main points that could help give an idea to his dexterity. Blues influence lines, unique phrasing, and playing over extended harmony. These all obviously go hand in hand and don't get used separately, which makes it difficult to examine one at a time. So let's look at different phrases and try to talk about how each pertain to the solos he took. I'll go out of order and jump between different solos, but just bear with me. So let's start at the top. This is a gorgeous phrase, quite Zappa. No other guitarist can capture the unique speech aspects that he was so influenced by. You can hear how well it flows as it feels like it speeds up and slows down, just like how we talk. He both opens and closes the phrase with the main motif, while in between keeping it consistently within the mode and mostly moving stepwise. I also want to say that unless something is a clear-cut idea of a group of odd rhythms, I think it's easier to notate and understand some notes as just moving behind or ahead of the beat. I know some people have disagreed on the notation from the Frank Zappa guitar book and how they went in favor for the most complicated notation when it could have been reduced as something simpler. Ultimately, don't get too hung up on the numbers. The important part is how it feels, and while the rhythm section keeps the pulse, he achieves this push and pull effect by odd numbered rhythms or moving a little bit behind the beat. The jazz saxophonist Dexter Gordon is another improviser that played pretty behind the beat. Like Zappa, his time was incredibly consistent enough to pull that off. This was something he also pointed out about his favorite guitar solo of all time, Three Hours Past Midnight by Johnny Guitar Watson. In the most calculated way, he can figure out how to play his lines that sound like they have no regard for the time, but are still perfectly cognizant of the rhythm section. Here's another phrase. Here's another one that seemingly goes back and forth between being cognizant of the time. The entire thing is a little bit behind the beat. The first bar, besides playing around with the main motif again, has the rapid fire notes that resolve into a very guitar-y sliding phrase over the neck that just feels like it floats. Quite a nice change from the rapid fire before, and really adds to the stop and startness. And a big part of achieving that feeling is that if you look at this, you'll notice there are barely any rhythmic values that are consistent for longer than a beat. That's another important quality of Frank's improvisation, not just the fact that he uses odd rhythms, but that it's almost never linear in terms of the rhythmic value. He's not going to eighth note you to death. And he even says as much, and how playing with what he calls nice neat scale patterns are always calling to be real studied capital M music. His way of moving beyond into emotional content is through this rhythmic approach. But speaking of slides, there are some real nice guitaristic phrases. This makes great use of bends as well, getting into the real essence of Frank's blues influence. The fun part is that you don't see many bends up to the ninth for standard blues players, especially following a quintuplet. This is sort of a nice microcosm of his music in general, the simple with the advanced. 
We again see the dichotomy of slow and fast, with the bends really adding to the vocal quality of the slow part against the frenzy of the rapid fire 30 second notes at the end. Here's another phrase utilizing blues like bends. Super nice bends and utilization of the low strings as well. So until the second to last bar, there are only five notes used in the entire phrase. D, E, F sharp, A, B, or D major pentatonic scale. By targeting this D tonal center with his bends, Zappa is really playing over the two chord here in relation to C. In so many Lydian tonalities, he targets the two chord, usually with a combination of Mixolydian and blues-like figures. For example, here in this A tonality, you can clearly see him playing B-shaped phrases. The line is actually blurred between where you could call the tonic sometimes if you just go strictly by his playing. He even ends on a D instead of a C, showing his ear is clearly thinking of that phrase happening in that tonal center. Again, this is the simple, melodic approach of pentatonics over the advanced major 7 sharp 11 harmony, but you get some really neat ideas, especially if you add in his blues and phrasing qualities to this aspect. And not only that, but I love the way he uses the low strings as well, which is another thing we can attribute to the vocal-like qualities of his improvisation. As he says, he's more a baritone guy, so playing on the low strings is in line with the way he talks. Now here's another phrase that opens the second chorus on volume 6. Well, you really couldn't be clear about playing over the 2 chord on this E-flat. I love this sound. When he utilizes both the flat 7 and flat 3rd to major 3rd connection of the F mixolydian, he comes up with some beautiful lines over an advanced harmony. For the C major, it would be playing over D mixolydian in this shape. For the E-flat major, it would be playing over F mixolydian in this shape. And speaking of playing over the 2, Frank opens his solo on jazz noise here with an F arpeggio. stepwise movement here again. We see a jump up to what I assume was supposed to be a C rather than playing a sharp 5 over this chord, and this is sort of like the big swifty figure that Frank quotes a lot. So he doesn't just play other harmonies on the major, here's an A arpeggio over the E minor. Starts off nice and easy and ramps up the speed of the notes in the last two bars. Here's the A arpeggio, the four chord over the E minor where we get that major six again. C natural we can assume was just a slip as he went for the C sharp. Great use of the open E string which he loves to use. I especially like when he switches between the open E string and the fretted note E, which is a bit like how saxophone players use alternate fingerings. The open versus the fretted can result in different tone or color, and you get some really neat sounds. Here's another example of using open strings and fretted notes, all the while playing over the two again.
He opens up here with an arpeggio of C major 9, and sweeps down A minor 9, the relative minor. He does like this specific figure, and has used it for the basis of another tune. Frank was a heavy user of sweeps in his quite unique picking style. He'd be quick to tell you his technique wasn't going to win him any awards, but his sweeps were actually pretty adept. This allowed him to come up with some really neat pentatonic lines. And finally, the phrase that ends in on Frank Zappa meets the mother's of prevention. A great use of open strings again. Notice again the clever switch between the open G and fretted G, and like before he loves that open string into a slide to the fretted note. So hopefully that gives a nice overview of Frank's approach and style. After the guitar solo, the fun begins with what is labeled as the B section, the next interlude. So now we get our first time signature change to 3-4. It'd be hard to say any time signature is one of Frank's favorites, given that he's used so many, but there are copious amounts of 3-4 examples. We also see for the first time 5-16, 3-16, 9-16, and 7-16. Interestingly, the interlude starts on B-flat minor because there's no place for a guitar solo in the score. The second ending of the melody is played again after the pre-guitar solo interlude. And just like how the second ending melody leads to a B-flat minor with D-flat as the melody for the first solo, it does so here again as the post-guitar solo interludes melody starts on D-flat over a B-flat minor chord. So more of the minor third root movement that we've seen so much of throughout already. All of this can be heard as was originally intended on the Steve Vai demo I mentioned before. The melody stays pretty much diatonic with some exceptions and consistent with Frank's modal preferences. Dorian on minors and Lydian on majors. There are some important devices here that he employs, like arpeggiation, contour or how his lines are shaped, repeated notes, and the use of 4th and 5th intervals, which will play into arpeggiation especially. Immediately we see the minor 3rd down a half step to the 9th B flat, C. This sort of mimics the melody on the G minor, which has B flat to A, but this time it differs rhythmically. The dotted 8th note then ties into an 8th note triplet, where the notes spell out an A flat triad starting on the 3rd. C, E flat, A flat. These upper extensions function as the 9th, 11th, and flat 7th. Then the last beat of the measure is 4 sixteenths, and just from the look of it we see some leaps. Wide intervals, especially major 7s, are a trademark of Frank's melodies. Most of that makes sense over B flat Dorian, but what is that E natural, or the sharp 4, doing there? Well this is another thoroughly employed technique. If we look a little bit closer and just take the pitches for what they are regardless of octave, we can see it's actually chromatic stepwise motion downwards. F, E natural, E flat. But by moving the octave in between the run, or displacing it, we get this really wide top to bottom vertical sound. If you've ever listened to a Zappa melody and felt wide jumps that feel like they move up and down almost randomly, it's probably this device called chromatic octave displacement. There are tons of examples in his work, but let's look at one from Who Needs the Peace Corps. Here's the phrase, but I put everything in the same octave. So let's identify the chromatic run. B flat A, G sharp G, F sharp F. Now it's an interesting line, but maybe for his ears it was a bit too predictable with all the chromatics. So he cleverly disguises it and adds a bit of direction, because nothing in his music is too calculated. The G then gets displaced down an octave to break the pattern. Let's hear the line now as it was originally recorded. Super creative as always, and gets that wide Zappa sound. Frez himself used that specific down a minor ninth and up a major seventh phrase, and Frank uses or quotes it so much it almost becomes a motif. I think there was this other jazz musician who Frank wrote a song for who also really loved very wide intervals. So here's the phrase with no displacement. And the phrase with displacement. It's also neat that each beat of the bar increases in total notes. Two on beat one, three on beat two even though there's a tie, and four on beat three. This next bar is fun. 
eight eighth notes in the space of six. There are six eighth notes in a bar of three four, and we're just putting in two extra ones and squeezing it to fit in that space evenly. This isn't as scary as you might think, and can be simplified to two groups of four over three. A lot of people know this rhythm by saying, pass the bread and butter, pass the bread and butter. What makes it interesting is the way it's beamed. A group of three, a group of two, and a group of three again. It's subtle, but you can hear the phrasing of this on the recordings. It's much faster at tempo though, and Chad Wackerman usually plays quarter notes on the kick drum to have some balance in there. The melodic content is a bit puzzling at first. The minor sixth of C to A flat is well within the Dorian tonality he's established, but then it goes down a flat nine, just like we saw in the previous bar, to A natural and up a fifth to E natural. Well really, the four notes are the same contour as the sixteenth notes on beat three of the last bar. You should all really check out the writings of Brett Clement on Zappa's works, because first off, he's way smarter than me, but also it'd be a crime if I didn't mention him because tons of what I've discussed is influenced by his work, including how in Alien Orifice, he noticed a specific four note segment that has the same exact contour throughout this interlude. We're going to see this up-down-up contour a whole lot, but back to the note choices. It's possible that A and E are just an anticipation of the next harmony, A major 7. Or, if you put the four notes together, it spells an A minor major 7, but looking past the E, we see another major 7th, G to F sharp. I think it's more likely that we put that together with the other minor ninth and get another chromatic row just like last time. F sharp, G, A flat, A. There's displacement again and it moves in opposite directions. A flat, which is the second highest note in the row, moving up to the highest note of A, while the G, the second lowest note, moves down to the lowest note of the row, F sharp. The E natural sticks in there as a pattern breaker, but adds a bit of stability as it's a strong interval as a fifth to the A. But I think the important thing to take away is the chromatic row, which moves in opposite directions, because that will come up a whole lot more in the next section. So we move to a new chord, and like I mentioned before, we see the most common type of modal center switch Frank uses, the minor 7 to major 7 half step movement. This time it goes down a half step from B flat minor to A major 7, Right away melodically, he establishes Lydian by landing on the sharp 11, D sharp. He then uses a neat little device of going up to the E natural and making the intervals larger by descending down the scale and repeating the E every time. It reminds me of the Eric Dolphy Memorial Barbecue. All the while, we see the contour motif used again, but what's really important is the end of the bar where we get another arpeggio, specifically of B, E, F sharp which could be inverted to spell E sus 2, one of the foundations of Frank's harmonic and melodic identity. Just to get right to the point, Frank Zappa loves sus 2. If you haven't seen the Ruth Underwood video of her explaining his utilization of the sound, definitely check it out. These three notes can be inverted and they're all used. First, you have a major second and a fifth, the straight sus 2. Then you have all fourths, which can be described as 7 sus 4, and then a fourth and a major second, a straight sus 4. I know I've said there are too many examples for a lot of what I've highlighted, but this one really takes the cake, and it's a very open sound because there's no third in there. So back to the interlude, we have the open-ended fourth of F sharp to B, and then see another open interval of a fifth, G sharp to D sharp, the major seventh to sharp eleventh. The contour that we've seen continues as that goes down a major sixth to F sharp, and then up a major second to G sharp again. Major second is all over this bar. F sharp, G sharp, E, F, and B, C sharp. He also uses every note in A Lydian except the root here, just like before on the C major 7 in the main theme. Now the last 16th of beat 1 is tied into the first note of a quintuplet, but look a little bit closer. Even though it's a group of 5 notes which would make the grouping uneven and break the contour pattern we've seen, 4 notes up down up is still intact because of the tied note. Super clever and still gets the contour motif in there, but with variance as a different rhythm than 4 16ths. The last 3 notes spell out a B sus 2, but it's arpeggiated as F sharp, B, C sharp. The next bar resolves up a step into an eighth note triplet. The harmony remains major seven but goes up a minor third, a cycle Frank loves and has already shown a lot of in this tune. The contour continues for two beats again as an eighth note triplet and a quarter. The major second theme continues over the bar line as the first two notes we get are D to E, with E being a common tone from the last chord. These three notes, a fourth from B to E and then the major second from E to F sharp, make up the same chord as we saw over the A major 7. Really cool that he highlighted these common tones over both A major 7 and C major 7. Beat 3 shows the contour again in an interesting group of notes, F sharp, G, D, A. He really likes this grouping of intervals and has used it a lot. You could look at it like a bunch of different ways inverted, like a major triad with a fourth, or a sus 2 with a major 7. Zappa has used these exact four notes in another melody, this time with the harmony being E minor. It's also used at the end of Sinister Footwear.
and it's what Ruth arpeggiates at the end of Inker Roads. Besides having the same contour, it's pretty close intervallically as beats 1 and 2, being a half step and a fifth instead of the fourth. The next bar is sort of a summary of a lot of the devices we've seen already. First, it's the same 8 over 6 polyrhythm and beamed exactly the same. And the first three notes are the same exact, you guessed it, B, E, F sharp. And starting on that F sharp, we can also see the same notes as beat 3 of the last bar, F sharp, G, A, D with the A and D swapped and the D up an octave. The last group of three notes spells a B minor triad starting on the third, D, then another fourth interval, B to F sharp. Just like how on the last harmony change from A major to C major, the melody went up a half step, we see the same thing here with another harmony change. Now we go up a fourth to F minor, and the F sharp melody note moves a half step up to the ninth, G, on beat one. We get another 16th note contour pattern starting on the 9th. The last bar of B-flat also started on the 9th, and as I said, we'll see a lot of emphasis on that extension. After that, it moves to the 11th and starts another sus2 inverted as 4th, from the bottom to top, as C, F, B-flat. Now on beat 2, we see for the first time in this interlude a changing harmony within the bar. We get another half-step movement in our first two chord harmony, E2. While it isn't the same as minor 7 and major 7, it's represented the same melodically as we have Dorian on F and Lydian on E. I love how when the F is established, the 16th note on beat 2 that it lands on could have operated as the minor 3rd, but now becomes the major 3rd of the new harmony. And, the first 3 notes are the same exact pattern as the first 3 over the F, but up a half step now, and with the 3rd note up an octave. Then we get another new harmony on beat 3. It's still sus 2 but is now moved up a fourth to A2. We see the exact opposite of the contour motif he's established, down, up, down. It starts with a fourth of G flat and D flat, but starting on the D flat, we see a sus2 in the stack of fifths arpeggio, D flat, E flat, A flat, the Inca Rhodes motif because of how he uses the stack of fifths in that melody. If we go back to the end of beat two, we see a G flat triad arpeggiated downwards from its fifth. D flat, B flat, G flat, D flat. So in seven bars, he's shown this contour 11 times, four sixteenths five times, four eighths in the space of three notes three times, a quarter plus three sixteenths, a quintuplet, and then an eighth note triplet plus a quarter note. That's a lot of creative rhythmic deviation here, while keeping the contour motif consistent. So since we saw Lydian on that A2, guess what comes next? If you said Dorian up a half step on B flat minor, pat yourself on the back. If you also mentioned it being in 516, pat yourself on the back again. Now we haven't encountered something like this yet, so let's talk about demystifying Zappa's odd time phrases. How do you deal with uncomfortable odd time? We can break down odd meters into groupings of smaller familiar numbers, being twos or threes. Let's take that five, get rid of the pitches, and leave the rhythm in beaming. There are two clear groups that we can see, the first of three and second of two. If we try counting, it becomes one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. But that's not the only combination. What if it's a group of two and a group of three? One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Now we have something to ground us with. Look at five, five, five from Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. Two bars of five, eight, and a bar of five, four. Zappa explains the way to count it. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, and three, and four, and five, and one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, and three, and four, and five, and. Now he's counting all eighth notes there, but it still applies. So here are the phrases in five. We see three bars of one two three one two, a bar of one two one two three, and two more bars of one two three one two. But what about the other time signatures that we've seen? How about seven sixteen? Well, here's the phrase, complete with accents and beaming again. Accents are so vital to the phrase. Without it, it becomes a monotonous series of notes that have no real sense of motion. We see two groups of two and a group of three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. For example, Big Swifty. Or the opposite grouping, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, can be heard in Markson's Chicken. In Alien Orifice, we only see the first grouping. And what about 916? We get even more possible combinations, and we can start to group these twos and threes. Any meter with a multiple of three as a numerator, such as 6, 9, 12, or 15, implies a subdivision of three. Of course, like all the concepts we've talked about, they aren't used normally. Specifically, he uses a group of four and a group we saw earlier that makes five, a group of two and a group of three. 
You can hear a good example of this in Catholic Girls, which also has a bar of 716. Or a kid in a zarf. But as there's only one bar of nine, this is our only grouping. And now we have a better understanding of that, and you can count in 11, 13, 19, 21. And remember, don't worry about the numbers, you just have to worry about what the feel is. So going back to looking at this melody, the time signature change from 3-4 to 5-16 doesn't feel as jarring as you'd think. Why is that? Because the 3-4 bar is all 16ths, which is the secondary unit, or the second subdivision of the pulse. It then becomes the pulse with the meter change, which makes it as fluid as it is. It's little things like this that make him a complete master at odd time. So these four bars, including one of 3-16, is consistently Dorian again. If we look at just the pitches over bar lines, we can see some more arpeggiation. First, an F minor down from the 5th. C, A flat, F, starting on the 9th once again. Then the next three notes, G, E flat, B flat, works as an E flat triad in verse inversion. Like we've talked about, the 4 chord gets the Dorian note in there with this arpeggio. And starting on that B flat, we can see B flat, C, F from the bottom note, a sus4, where the F is repeated. The next bar could be thought of as an all A flat triad, and we see the same pattern as the bar before. The third note is repeated to start the group of two. After that, he repeats the A-flat again, this time starting as the downbeat of a 316 and arpeggiating the stack of fourths down, A-flat, E-flat, B-flat. As far as the use of repeated notes, Tommy Morris brings up a super interesting point that Frank's love of percussion plays a role. Because notes die away immediately on a marimba, reiterating the note is the best way to sustain it. And I think this is a brilliant observation. Another important aspect is that repetition of any kind creates emphasis. In this case, the first is rhythmic. The repeated notes establish this by being the third and fourth notes of these two bars, making a pattern. Every new repeated note is also accented, and this will hold true for every repeated note from here on out. The second emphasis is melodic. The three notes that are repeated are F, C, and A flat. Now look at the first three notes of this phrase, C, A flat, and F. Clearly they are of importance. We come back to 3-4, a more comfortable meter again, and the harmony is changed. Now we have the stack of fourths as the harmony instead of the melody. In fact, it's a whole step up from the melody in the 316 bar. B flat, B flat, A flat, a C7 sus, C, F, B flat. The melody is another jump of a fifth up from the previous B flat to the fourth of the new chord, F. It ties into the E of beat three where it descends, but notice this isn't Dorian or Lydian now. Remember, there's a flat seven in the chord, but it descends F, E, D, C, with the major third in there. We can identify this as C mixolydian now. This is the beauty of the sus harmony. The flat 7 lowers your options, of course, but with no third in the chord, you can choose between major like mixolydian or minor like Dorian. So just as we navigated through those tricky 5-16 bars to get back to what feels like home in 3-4, boom, we're hit with more odd time. This is what's so great about this section. It sort of lulls you into a false sense of feeling home again in 3, until more dreaded math. Just another tension and resolution that he's set up. So continuing over this stack of fourths, we see another repeated note between the last sixteenth of beat 3 into the downbeat of the 5 16th bar. Notice this time the irregular subdivision has shifted this group of 5. It's now a group of 2 and a group of 3, as opposed to before where we saw a group of 3 and 2. And starting at the root, which is doubled here, we see an F triad from the 5th, C, F, A. Really nice open sound over that stack of fourths. And starting at the 9 16, he gets super close to playing with the motif of the main theme. G, B flat, A. Instead, we see A, B flat, A, G. There's another repeated note heading into the next group of two on G, and he even teases the theme with G, B flat, but it heads to F instead of A. I love how the last three notes of the bar are grouped, because it really mimics the resolution we see from the 316 to 3, 4 bars. Same contour of down, down, with a resolution up a fifth, and back home to 3, 4 again. And the harmony has moved up a whole step. So after that brief resolution to D and back home in 3, it's another phrase, but in 716, now grouped 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and consistent with Lydian because it uses all the notes except the fifth. He establishes a little repeating contour of down, up, down, up, and quickly breaks it again. That contour is, of course, another that we've seen before. 
It also reminds me of one of the lines from the seventh section of Inca Roads, both over D. Lydian and a very similar contour. The leap from the seventh here up a fifth and down a major second, you should be aware when that happens now, makes another sus, from the bottom note of C sharp, G sharp, F sharp, a sus four. Starting on that last note of that sus chord can actually give us another, by how it goes up a fourth and up a major second, F sharp, B, C. The combination of up a fourth or fifth plus major second sort of becomes its own motif, as he spells out the sus chords. And remarkably, it doesn't go up a whole step after that, but in fact, does perhaps the only functional move in the entire song. It goes down to the relative minor of D, B minor. We see another repeated note from the last 16th to the downbeat, which also functions as a delayed resolution from the 4th, E up to the 5th of B, F sharp. We get the resolution in a 3-4 bar again like last time, so we should brace ourselves for more odd time to smack us in the face again, except there's another 3-4 bar. Well, maybe the resolution is heard now, since the pattern is finally broken. Nope. These two 5-16 bars come out of nowhere, right when he's got your ear where he wants you. We're back to a group of 3 and 2, but what's happening here? It sounds a bit less diatonic than the rest of what we heard in this section so far. Well, it's not really far off from something we've already seen. We talked about the chromatic row of 4 notes and how it'll move in opposite directions, like in the second bar with F-sharp, G, A-flat, A, well, this is the same idea here, but no displacement. Instead of that wide, spread out, and up and down feeling, it feels closed in, tight, and almost claustrophobic because of the lack of space between the chromatic row. This also foreshadows the coming section. The row here from bottom to top is G-sharp A, A-sharp B, where it starts on G-sharp and goes up a major second to A-sharp, then up a minor second to B, and down a major second to A. It actually does make sense diatonically if you use that A-sharp as a passing tone. But of course, it wouldn't be fun if there wasn't one displaced note, so the first two sixteenths of the second bar are the same G-sharp and A-sharp that start the row, but with the G-sharp up an octave. The last four notes could make sense diatonically as well, with the first three of those spelling out a B-flat diminished, with B-flat, C-sharp, E. You could make a case, I personally wouldn't, that it was functioning as a 5-7 chord, resolving to the minor third of B on that last sixteenth. This also includes a diatonic enclosure around that note of D. Nevertheless, that finishes the B section and leads us into something even wilder. But before that, there are some other aspects of this. When it was announced that there was going to be a Zappa hologram show, part of the appeal was that they were going to premiere new music. Rumors came in from people that had seen the show that it was something of a precursor to Drowning Witch, which immediately sparked my interest. A video surfaced with the title number 2, which makes sense as at one point Frank had written little pieces he called inserts, with only numbers as the title. Some of these made it into songs, like number 6 in Jumbo Go Away. So when I saw a video of this performance, it did in fact include part of Drowning Witch. But, something else caught my ear, and I noticed what seemed to be a precursor to this interlude of Alien Orifice. How cool is that? And obviously very close to this Alien Orifice interlude, specifically the root movement. I thought that was really neat to hear an early version of that section. Like I said, the reuse of material is such a huge theme. He was always repurposing and deviating. Speaking of which, the other thing to discuss is that of course like other aspects of this tune, there is discrepancy between recordings. This one is very calculated though, as it was arranged on Make a Jazz Noise here, specifically for the horn section. So the real difference here? It stays 3-4 consistently throughout. Scott Tunis, the bass player on every recording of this track, was kind enough to answer my question as to why Frank decided to do this. Essentially, schmooshing, or reducing if you want to get technical, the notes so they fit into 3-4 was funny to him. And the consistent jazz feel was, uh, 
more suited for the members of that 88 band. Guitarist on the track Mike Keneally also chimed in that Frank was aiming for a cool jazz swing vibe. Thanks again to Scott and Mike for letting me bother them with questions. Remember, this is just another example of a classic deviation technique, isomelism. Same pitches, different rhythms. So Frank wanted to schmoosh, but how? Well, here's the first time we see different rhythms. Same time signature of 3-4, but the 8 over 6 rhythm is employed here now, instead of 4 sixteenths and an 8th note quintuplet. This works because if we look at the first bar, including the tied note, there are 8 notes. Fits like a glove. The next change is the 5 16 bars. How many 16th notes fit in a bar of 3-4? Four? 4 for every beat, giving us 12. Let's take the first 12 16ths that appear in the 5 16 bars and fill that evenly. That leaves us with 3 16ths left over from the last 5 16 bar, 3 16ths from the 3 16 bar, and the half note on the 3-4 bar. So how do you fit that into one 3-4 bar? 7 notes there, so he'll change the rhythm a bit and use 8th note triplets and a quarter note that lands on beat 3 with an anticipated resolution. Now from that starting point, we're left with 8 16th notes. How does he fit that into 3-4 while keeping the phrasing? The 3 16th starting on E of beat 3 now move a beat earlier. The 2 16th notes from the 5 16 bar fit perfectly, and he cleverly turns the last group of 3 into a 16th note triplet. The 9 16 bar seems obvious for the first beat, 4 16ths. How do you fit 5 notes into 2 beats though? Of course, with a quintuplet. That just leaves us with the bar of 7, including the first 2 16ths of the last 3 4 bar. That gives us 9 in total perfect for three groups of triplets. After that, it's back to business as usual. Zappa goes with trumpet and tenor playing this melody, classic combo, while the alto, trombone, and barry support with chords. He's almost always lowest voice on the bottom up. Barry, trombone, tenor, alto, trumpet is how it's voice low to high. The first chord hit is on the A major 7 where the melody note is on the sharp 11, D sharp. It reads from bottom to top, E, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, or 5th, 3rd, 7th, sharp 11. Really pretty voicing, and notice the C-sharp sus2 in there. The next hit is beat 2 of the C major 7, where the melody is E. It reads from the bottom, C, G, B, E. Pretty standard major 7th voicing there, root, 5th, 7th, 3rd. Next one is the anticipated hit on beat 3, on C7 sus. Melody note is F, from bottom to top is C, B flat, C, F. Real earthy and open, just the straight up notes of the chord, and the root is doubled. This next one is my favorite, the D chord with the D in the melody. D, A, E, F sharp, D. Who doesn't love a major with the second in there? And finally, the last one on B minor with the melody on F sharp, reading B, E, C sharp, D, F sharp. This one is super interesting too, really crunchy with the second and third in there, only a half step between them in the minor chord. And with that, we're off to section C, the second half of this wild and intense interlude. Take a breath. There's so much going on here textually that I think works so well. The fast sixteenths, the harmonic rhythm changing every bar, crazy intervals filled with tension, it all adds to this huge feeling of restlessness. That works as a great contrast to the previous section, especially the easy cool jazz version on Make a Jazz Noise here. So we get into a new time signature of 2-4. You may wonder why this is in 2 instead of 4, even though this could really fit in either. Well, beat 1 and 4 will get more emphasis than beat 3. Whereas in 2, you're getting the same amount of emphasis every other quarter note. Strong, weak, strong, weak, as opposed to strong, weak, medium, weak. It's probably difficult to perceive, but the harmonic rhythm, or where the chords change, helps this feeling of the measure ending at 2 beats. And a lot of music like marches or sambas relies on 2. The harmony is now a stack of fourths. G sharp, C sharp, F sharp, as G sharp 7, sus 4. The section definitely feels like it contains lots of chromaticism that almost seems like it ignores the harmony. Well, we can start to really think intervallically as opposed to the last section, which was largely diatonic. You can build tension in melodies the same you would in improvisation. Playing out doesn't have to be restricted to one or the other. After a repeated note from the bar before on D, now we see D, C sharp, D sharp, E. Remember before when I showed the chromatic row and how it went in opposite directions? Well, we're in full swing of that now as we see a four note row from C sharp up. And like I said, he really, really likes to use this idea. Here it is in approximate. The row is G, A flat, A, B flat, and it moves in opposite directions. A flat down to G, and A up to B flat, which is displaced down an octave. 
Sometimes it's not a full chromatic row, but two half steps that are separated by one or two notes, like the one that starts off the Eric Dolphy Memorial Barbecue. B up to D, and C sharp down to A sharp. So back to this section. The sus harmony really allows these groups to flourish because of how open it is with no third in there. This means he can go back and forth between a variety of sounds or melodic ideas without being too tied down. If you know anything about Zappa, you probably know he didn't like to be put into a box and told what he could or could not do. So beat 2 starts as an imitation of beat 1, with a minor second from D to C sharp, but down a whole step, C to B. These are the lowest notes of the entire bar, and make it into a larger chromatic row encompassing a perfect fourth. B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. The last two notes end up working as a chromatic enclosure of the first note of the next bar, C sharp. Ultimately, I don't think we can tie this bar down to a tonality. It's the intervallic qualities that are coming out. The next bar sees an F sharp minor as the harmony. The root from G sharp actually moves up a half step to A, while the other voices remain constant, giving us the minor chord and verse inversion. Beat 1 shows the same exact contour as beat 1 of the previous bar, and it's almost the same exact except the first note, which is now C sharp, the fifth of the harmony, instead of D. By keeping that contour and most of the pitches the same, it almost seems like a question and answer between the first two bars. We have question, answer, question, answer. Beat 2 of B, C, G sharp, E shows an interesting arpeggio, a C major 7 with a sharp 5, or you could call it C augmented major 7. This arpeggio functions over the harmony as 4, flat 5, 9, and 7. This same exact chord is featured heavily in the verse of Andy, and it'll show up a lot more later. The next two bars are melodically the exact same, but transposed. First, we see the root move up a tritone from F sharp to C2. Besides all the other movements we've seen that Zappa loves, like minor third or fifth, he also really likes tritone too. Some examples are Who Needs the Peace Corps, or Cyborg. We see beat one is pretty diatonic, actually. F, E, B flat, G, or 4, 3, 7, 5. You could easily call that Mixolydian. What happens after that changes it, though, as we see another row created here. F sharp, G, A, B flat. Two half steps in opposite directions again. B flat down to G, and F sharp up to A. The last two notes of E flat to B surround the phrase at the lowest and highest notes of the bar. Funny enough, B2 spells out a B7 arpeggio. B, E flat, and harmonic of D sharp. F sharp, A. Now those are some crunchy notes over a C2 harmony. Do you see how he can dip in and out of what his ear wants? The first four sixteenths can squarely fit in a mode, and the next four really take you out to lunch. It's almost like before how he can make you feel at home in the three four bars until the odd time smacked you in the face. He plays so well with expectations and opposites and how they can mix you up. Adding to that, the contours are opposite which really drives that home. Down, up, down, up, down, up. And like I said, the next bar is the same exact but transposed down a major third. The bar after sees familiar root movement again, up a fifth from A flat to E flat on another two chord. Now, the harmony is going to last for three bars, so he can really play with taking it in and out melodically. The first bar is entirely diatonic, starting up a half step from G to a five note group of A flat, B flat, F, G, C, or 4, 5, 2, 3, 6. This includes a B flat two chord as the last three notes, B flat, C, F. Next bar again goes up a half step melodically from F to F sharp and he takes it out with the four note group we've seen before. Yep, the G, A, D, F sharp group. This time over E flat 2, which is really interesting, because it essentially has a D major triad over E flat. Beat 2 shows a sus 4 group plus a major 7th. B flat, E flat, F as the sus 4 plus the major 7th, A. Of course, that's just literally an inversion of the harmony, and if you include the G that precedes this four note group, it pretty obviously spells Lydian. Just to really drive the point home, over the sus harmony he can flip back and forth melodically so easily like in this bar. And once again for the third time in a row, the next bar starts up a half step from A to B flat. This four note group of B flat, F, G flat, A flat operates as fifth, second, minor third, fourth. Pretty straight up minor here. And instead of heading back to the starting note, goes up a half step to A and starts another arpeggio of a seventh chord, this time F7. A, C, F, E flat. Earlier we saw a seventh chord over the C2 and A flat 2. Doesn't get more obviously Lydian than F7 over E flat. That harmony now moves up a fifth again to a familiar B flat minor chord. That's not the only thing we've seen before though. Check out the melody here. Literally the same melodic material that opens up the post guitar solo interlude. Before it was in 3 4, and we know now we're in 2 4 this time. So how does it fit? Well, with the power of isomelism, he cleverly smooshes it all sixteenths now. 
After this reappearance, we see the harmony stay minor and move up a major third to D minor. Some very interesting melodic qualities here, starting on the 5th of A, down a half step to A flat, up a 4th to D flat, and down a half step to C. The C repeats, and we see the same arpeggio of C major 7 sharp 5 that we saw over the F sharp minor. Now it functions as 7th, 13th, sharp 11, and 9th in relation to D. This also works as minor Lydian, which we talked about before in the pre-guitar solo interlude. One of the defining factors of that is a major chord a major second away from a minor chord. In this arpeggio, it also includes an E triad over the D minor. Except D flat, this all works as D Dorian sharp 4. This next bar seeds another arpeggio, this time a C major 7 with a natural 5th, going down as C, B, G, E. It's the same exact order as the last arpeggio, C, B, G natural instead of G sharp, and then E, except now the C's and E's have switched octaves. But after that, we're quickly back in minor Lydian mode. A flat, F, C, B. Again, all notes of Dorian sharp 4. Now we see another take on the minor to major half step movement, with D minor moving to D flat augmented. Augmented chords are built as root, third, sharp 5, and they can serve a variety of functions. It can take part in many chords, just like we saw in the C major 7 sharp 5 arpeggio. It can also be in a dominant 7 sharp 5, dominant 7 sharp 11, or a minor major 7. Interesting also that there's a one note difference harmony wise, with the root of D minor moving down a half step to D flat, and the F and A remaining consistent. Instead of two groups of four sixteenths, I think this group melodically works as two separate arpeggios in almost a question and answer. We see yet another C major 7 arpeggio going down after the previous one in the last bar, G, C, B, E, with a repeated note in the middle of C. If we examine the augmented scale, which consists of two augmented arpeggios, D flat and E in this case, we see C and E as the only notes that really fit in there. The last three notes get even weirder. We see an A flat sus 2 in the Inca Road stack of fifths formation. A flat is the only note that fits in the scale. So what do we make of this? The identity comes more from intervallic implications than any harmonic tonality that he's set in. It repeats again, and then the harmony slides down a half step to C augmented, and he establishes a four note pattern, down a minor third, repeat, and down a half step for it to go up a minor third from the original note and start again. It starts on the major seventh B, then A flat G, then up to D, B, B flat, and finally F, but this time it goes down a major second E flat, then down a half step to D. Then we're back to another familiar arpeggio. Remember the C major 7 sharp 5? Well, we see it again, but transpose the third on G. F sharp, G, E flat, C flat. He really loves this arpeggio, and it certainly helps that one of his favorite intervals, the major 7th, is in there. The C augmented essentially operates as a dominant chord now, as it then resolves to F sus 2. Like we've seen previously, the melody resolves a half step, and we're going to get a whole string of that starting here, with C flat to B flat. He establishes another two note pattern based on major seconds, first on B flat to A flat, the fourth to minor third, then up a fourth to A flat to D flat, where the pattern ascends chromatically. D flat, C flat, D, C, E flat, D flat. After this, the harmony moves up a fourth again, and we get a new quality that's a little bit surprising. B flat diminished, spelled B flat, D flat, F flat. We also see a new time signature, 3-8. Earlier I mentioned that numerators that are divisible by 3 means the pulse is usually subdivided in groups of 3, a compound meter. And 3-8 can be considered this way, but I actually think it's a simple meter, where the pulse is divided by 2 notes for 3 beats. To be compound, you would essentially feel it in 1, the length of a dotted quarter note. The end of what's new in Baltimore and Mogio has that feel to me. That's not the case here. Even though the beaming doesn't reflect that, Inca Rhodes also has to me a clear case of simple 3-8. Anyways, he doesn't completely abide by the harmony and uses a four note group, C, G, F, B flat. The first three of which outline in F sus 2. With A, D, E now, we have A sus 4. We also move back to odd time in something we've already seen, 5, 16. Melodically, we're back into tonality land from here on out with no more chromaticism. It's possible he wanted to keep it more open and free when the rhythm was more strict in 2, 4, and now that it's odd time again, he can be stricter melodically. And once again, the melody resolves by half step, C up to C sharp. This actually ends up as some chromatic octave displacement that crosses bar lines when we include the first two sixteenths. We see C, C-sharp, D, where the D is down an octave. It's grouped as 2-3 here, the first two notes as a minor ninth down from C-sharp to D, and then up a fourth for the last three, G, A, B. The fourth and major second from D, of course, spells D sus 4. So over the root chord of A sus 4, we can easily identify this as mixolydian. We have the third and flat 7 right here. Next bar is group 2-3 again and has the same exact contour. This time we see a chromatic enclosure around the first note, A and B surrounding A-sharp on the downbeat. And again we see a minor ninth down from A-sharp to B and then up a fourth, then a major second again. 
except this time it goes up a major 6 from F sharp to D sharp. This time the harmony is a stack of fourths from F sharp up, so we see the root movement he loves again, a minor third down from A sus4 to F sharp 7 sus4, and it's the same mode but mixolydian in F sharp now. And once again we see the melody resolve up a step from D sharp to E. And like we saw over the A sus4 chord where we got three chromatic notes in a row, we see the same thing except but with no displacement. D sharp, E, F. The harmony is moved once again up a minor 6 to D minor. Last time we saw this chord there were heavy minor Lydian implications, but now we're strictly minor. And still in 516, but the grouping has changed to 3-2 now. E, F, C, then a repeated note of C, then E. He cleverly flips the grouping back for the next bar to 2-3, and even though the harmony remains, we still get a half step up from the last note of E to F. The group is now F E and F E C. We only see those three notes in these two bars, and they function as the 9th, 3rd, and minor 7th. The last bar of D minor shows another repeated note to start off, and the grouping is still 2-3. C down a 5th to G, and then a 3 note group of A, F, D flat. This technically spells out an A augmented triad, but I think he's also hinting at the harmony to come after this bar, which is a B flat minor. The D flat is the minor 3rd, making this an anticipation. And it's also a half step away from the first note on B flat minor, C. The grouping is flipped again, 3 and 2. C, then back up to that minor 3rd of D, then down to an F that repeats, and down to E flat. The last bar of B flat minor then goes up to G, the major 6, which tells us we're in Dorian again. It goes back up to E flat, then a leap down to G, which repeats, and up a 4th to C. This final bar is just a C minor arpeggio. And then the final two bars are back home to 3-4. Remember that he could use fast odd time in 3 as indicators of tension and resolution. He ends the phrase back in 3-4 to tell us that this insane melodic line has finally come to an end. The harmony moves up a fourth to E flat major 7 sharp 11, a chord we have experience with in this tune. The last two notes of the 516 and the first of the 3-4 spell out a G sus4, G, C, D, a quite fitting end for this section. So this final interlude is just beautifully shaped between contour and repeated notes. Notice that on every grouping of 3-2, the third and fourth note are repeated. The same exact thing happens in the first part of the interlude in the 516 bars. Even though it's entirely 16th notes, it works because of all these techniques. Look at how much variance there is. I went through and counted all the different contours from the beginning to the 3-8 bar. The most we see is down, up, down, but overall it's pretty balanced between all the combinations. Bring in all the creative harmonic and melodic techniques, and you get a really special section. Instrumentation-wise, on Meets the Mothers of Prevention in Volume 6, it's Tommy Mars on synth and Ed Mann on marimba. The electro comp is set to a chord, but I can't exactly figure out which one. On Jazz Noise here, it's Ed Mann again and Mike Keneally on guitar. And let me just say, Mike Keneally is a brave man for playing this line on guitar and actually doing a fantastic job. Actually, anyone who plays this line is a hero in my book. The horn section comes in on the D-flat augmented line and plays it in unison until the end, and then plays this little flourish before it heads back to the main theme. That's just up the E-flat Lydian scale. I'll meet some others of prevention in volume 6, Steve Vai and Bobby Martin on sax, enter two bars later on C augmented. Vai ends with a nice me bend up to D, and Tommy Mars is a run up the scale to really build it up. So right at the end of this interlude we hit E flat major 7 sharp 11, feels perfect. We're seamlessly back at the first chord of the tune, Zappa has perfectly executed this dense section with a transition back to the main theme, right? Well, not exactly. It's pretty difficult to find interviews that have Zappa talking about in-depth musical components of his work, especially after the PMRC hearings, where that's all anyone ever wanted to ask him. There are exceptions, though, one case being the aptly named Musician Magazine from 1979. The entire thing is worth a read, and there are some hilarious parts, but the most informative part is where he talks about his compositional technique he's been working on, seven-part harmony, or chords made entirely of a scale with no notes doubled. He then gives an example using C major, E, F, A, C, D, G, B, going up as the 3rd, 4th, 6th, root, 2nd, 5th, and 7th, all the notes in the scale. And he also uses chords built in fifths. We've talked about how important that interval is already. Again using C major he shows C, E, B, F sharp, G, D, A. Starts with a 3rd, C, E, then a stack of fifths, E, B, F sharp, then a half step where he gets another stack, G, D, A. We see something pretty close to this earlier over C major 7, where it's B, E, F sharp, G, A, D. It's also in night school. This seven note harmony shows up a lot in his classical work as well, like Envelopes on the London Symphony Orchestra album, where we see seven note chords and scales other than the major scale. So he decides to harmonize this melody at the end with all seven note voicings, or entire scales. And the first one is cleverly the relative minor of E flat Lydian, C Dorian. Here he voices it with the fifth in the bass, and you can hear Scott Tunis play it G, C, E flat, F, B flat, D, A. 
could look at it like a combination of a triad and a seventh chord. On the bottom is C minor and second inversion, then a B flat major seven and second inversion with the fifth on the bottom up, F, B flat, D, A. The next chord is a little different. We start on B flat, then go up a minor six to F sharp, a half step to G, a sharp four up to C sharp, a half step up to D, whole step up to E, and then a fourth up to A. Man, just listen to the transition from the last chord to this one. Man, that chord is so nasty. I love it. And we see A, E, D, C sharp. Take away the D and we get an A major triad. Now take that D and group it with the B flat, F sharp, and G. G, B flat, D makes a G minor triad. Remember we have a formula for a minor triad and a major triad a whole step apart. G minor Lydian. Adding in the F sharp would give us this scale. The fourth mode of harmonic minor, G Lydian flat 3. The third chord sees the bottom note move down a half step to A, and the top note move to F sharp as it does in the melody, of course. We see it go up a minor third to C, up another minor third to D sharp, a half step to E, a minor third to G, a third to B, and then a fifth to F sharp. We see an A minor here, A, C, E. Put the D sharp in the other group, and we can see B major, B, F sharp, D sharp, A minor plus B, another A minor Lydian here. Here we get Dorian sharp 4. We can get minor Lydian on different scales, both modes of either harmonic minor or harmonic major. And one thing that's pretty hard to notice because it happens fast, he changes the melody by one note. He keeps it B-flat in the 12 tuplet here. And, instead of the E we saw last time, it's now E-flat, plus F-sharp instead of G in the second bar. These changes are to cleverly fit inside the harmony. The last chords see something very familiar in the top four notes again. Back to A on the melody and going down is A, F-sharp, D, G. The same group we've seen so much throughout this piece. So from the bottom we see B, C, E-flat. We get an obvious D major triad here and a C minor triad here once again. So it's minor Lydian, this time on C. C Lydian flat 3 again, the fourth mode of G harmonic major. And now at the end we basically get a third ending, a completely different end of the phrase than the past two times we've seen it. It's still 12 eighths in the space of 8, and we see another septuplet at the end, but melodically it's different now. First two notes of A are the same as the first ending, but instead of going to F natural, it goes to F sharp to fit the chord, then up a tritone to C, which creates an F sharp diminished arpeggio, and back down to G that repeats, up a second to A, then down another tritone to E flat. Notice C utilizes both tritones in the scale, and they go in opposite directions. F sharp up to C, and A down to E flat. From there it goes up a minor third to F sharp, creating an E flat diminished arpeggio, then the septuplet. It keeps the same contour that we've seen a bunch of times. Down, up, down, up. G, F sharp, A, G. Then the last three notes spell a sus4, of course. D, C, G. You gotta love that he can identify the sus chords in any tonality. Of course, this wouldn't be complete if there wasn't some discrepancy here between recordings. So those chords are what's listed on the score, and like the first solo section on the score starting on B-flat minor and being used for the 84 and 88 bands, this is also the case. On Jazz Noise here, you can hear those chords behind the horns as they play the main theme the last time, but as it was played in 81 and 82, it's a bit different. Guitar, sax, and percussion would play the melody, while Tommy Mars would arpeggiate on the roads. The first harmony is G Dorian. You can hear guitarist Ray White chunking away at an F, while the Rhodes plays chords like these. The second chord, which was G minor Lydian, still has an A major triad that Ray White chunks and B flat in the bass. This is a little bit closer to diminished tonality, as Rhodes arpeggiates the whole half scale starting on B flat. The third chord sees D in the guitar, and the Rhodes first arpeggiates just that major scale as well, while the bass pedals the fifth, A. In the back half though, it switches to D harmonic major, with the B flat in there. And finally the last chord. Back to F in the guitar, and just plain old C Dorian arpeggiated. And now that we've reached the last statement of the main theme, with the first one being jazz and the second being straight eighth rock, let's look at the rhythm section here again. The eighth notes are swung again as opposed to the last time, and if you notice there is something the guitar, bass, and drums are all doing. Look at the first beat of every bar, where there are all rests. The drums specifically are playing a type of beat called a one-drop rhythm. Essentially, it's not playing beat one or dropping it, while accenting beat three still. The bass and guitar follows, where we see the root played in octaves and guitar doing short, chunky hits on two and four. We have evidence that this is reggae now, a style heavily abundant in Frank's work. And the real beauty of this rhythm is how unbelievably perfect it fits the melody, like it was crafted to be in the style the whole time. It's got a built-in rest right on beat one here, so everyone on the band is off at the same time. This leads to a perfect break each time, where everyone would be dramatically silent, as opposed to the first time in the main theme, where they all play through. 
So like I showed before, he loves to present stuff in different styles, like with his hand signals. Here in this tune, we get a controlled version of that, and we can see how the theme permutates from jazz to rock to reggae, all in one song. And it all feels authentic because you bet his band could always play any style among the best of them and make it feel good. So once that finishes, we're at the end of the tune with just the outro. We hit a new time signature, 7-4. Why 7 here? Well, in this section we see 7 note chords once again. One note for each quarter note, so it fits the bar perfectly. So what are the chords here? The first one we've seen before, the G minor Lydian chord. All these chords get arpeggiated downwards for a beat. A, E, D, C sharp, G, F sharp, B. Next one moves down a minor third, with the bass note being G. It's also a chord we've seen before, but voiced a little differently. The same C Dorian chord, but now voiced going down as F, C, B flat, A, E flat, D, G. That's beautiful. The third chord is really close to the first construction wise, but with a one note difference. From top down is D flat, A flat, G, F, B, A sharp, D natural. D whole half diminished without the eighth note of the scale in there, E. And then the very last chord is the same as the first, but down an octave. Notice the top notes go down in major thirds, spelling an augmented chord, A, F, D flat, A. And each of the top four notes is triad plus a fourth group of notes, A major plus D, F major plus B flat, D flat major plus a sharp four G, and then the A plus D down an octave, just like the D, A, G, F sharp group. Also, on the recordings from 81 to 82, the first and last chord is spelled A, E, D sharp, C sharp. So the same chord we see in the third bar instead of A, E, D, C sharp. The very last bar of the tune is back to 4-4, four, four, and it's a big old E minor 11, spelled E, B, G, D, F sharp, G, A. Notice how we get that D, F sharp, G, A group once again, this time now an E minor as the pedal. And of course, the top note is an A, a perfect closing. The one note we see targeted so much rings out as a perfect ending. The 8182 bands would just hit this chord and hold on to it, hence the fermata, until the next tune. Or, the ending on Meets the Mothers of Prevention has this very regal sounding overdub piano, which switches back and forth between C and D major before ending on D. Gotta be honest, that one's not my favorite. Starting on 84 and as heard on Make a Jazz Noise, however, he threw in a new melodic line to end it, which is really great. So this is built of three jumps, one of a fourth, B to E, and two fifths, D to A, and F sharp to C sharp. In between, there's a major second from E to D, a minor third from A to F sharp, and another major second from C sharp to B. I noticed the D triad in there. He loves that major from the flat seventh over a minor chord. The horns are all unison on this line until the last note. B, G, F sharp, D, and E. And with that, we finish the tune. So, like I said earlier, you have to meet Frank's music on its own terms. To call him a rule breaker doesn't exactly characterize this. It's so idiosyncratic that the rules are virtually irrelevant. The way Zappa seamlessly moves through dense or sparse harmony, odd rhythms or authentically played styles, you just can't even properly equate it with anything else. I think Alien Orifice is really genius level execution in a lot of techniques, mainly his ways of variation and deviation. There are so many layers of keeping it constant and changing something around it, from how he keeps one common tone while the chords change underneath, to presenting those chords in three different styles, keeping a consistent contour while changing the notes, reusing material over different pedals, or reusing the same melodic content with different rhythms, even between different recordings. All of this is just so brilliant. And making this was really as much for me as it was for anyone else. I wanted to have concrete evidence for why I think this is one of the best pieces of music ever written, past what my ear tells me. And all that I've found out has only strengthened that opinion for me. Thanks for watching. If you like, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm also available for private lessons, so feel free to shoot me a message. I'd like to make more of these, even if only 10 people see this, and if you think it sucks. So if you have any other Zappa tunes you'd like to see, let me know. Thanks for watching.